All right, it's Ray from Pro Shape of Sheet Metal in Charlton, Massachusetts, and we're on segment 8C of the all aluminum E type bonnet build. This was the rear piece that goes right here, and in 8B, we got it uh, shaped up uh, where all the area value was correct, we got it marked, and we started putting these first radiuses, these upper radiuses. And now we have to put this lower radius in. And we're going to do that lower radius with the tipping wheel set up over here. We just got to, we've got the line all marked and we've got to drive along that line. And we're going to throw this flange out and put this radius in. So we have the uh, maple upper wheel with some duct tape on it, some Gorilla Tape. And we're going to use that as the fulcrum. And this is the lever and we're just going to carefully steer over here right on the line which came from the flexible shape pattern and we're going to lift this up. In the process of lifting this up we're probably going to upset the uh, correct angle that we've got in here now, this radius here. Um, so it's a little bit of give and take back and forth to get this just right. So there was the first pass, and I'll try to pull it from here, and it'll bend that radius less, the up the top radius. I want to try to get all the force right in the lower radius here. I have to keep adjusting. And then we'll move the full rolling fulcrum, the wheel, a little bit so we don't have a real sharp radius. We want one that's a little dull. So we'll try to steer it a little bit to the left and a little bit to the right of the line to, to uh, soften that radius up a little bit. As we're doing this, we're losing this and we're going to have to put that back in a little bit. Uh, it's a little painstaking job that has to be done to get it correct. The only other way to do this would be uh, with a hammer form die of some sort or a press die or maybe just slapping it over a, a, um, a wooden block of some sort, a, a post dolly of some sort. You can do it always several different ways. They all yield a really nice result if you take your time. All this stuff takes a lot of time to do. There's no machine that you can go boop, 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 and it's perfect. Just doesn't happen. Sounds good in theory, but in practice it just doesn't work out. So you can see that's starting to take a pretty nice, we started here and we got about probably four passes through and it's starting to look pretty good. So we'll check the gauge on it in a little while, but first I think we'll do the other side and then, then we'll dial this in a little bit better. If all goes well, we should be able to engineer this joint and uh, maybe get it welded together today. I know everybody's waiting to see this thing done, but it's going to take longer than everybody generally figures. It's a lot of time to put one of these together. It's actually going up a little easier than I thought. This is that uh, Chinese sourced aluminum. And the first time I encountered it, I hated this stuff and I wanted to send it back, but I, I suffered through it. And the next time I ordered aluminum, I told them I wasn't happy with the last batch they sold me. And uh, I think they did source it from some other location. And the, the 
next batch was much more malleable. They're both labeled 3003 H14s, but uh, that Chinese sauce stuff was really, really stiff. Now, you have to fight with it. This is in the unannealed condition too, but I've uh, found that you take your time, it will go where you want it to go. It's stiff and it makes a really beautiful panel. The dent resistance in it is amazing. So now we'll check the gauges on it. All right, here we are. Um, we skipped a little bit because we're trying to make this uh, 8C, not 8F or something. So um, I finished doing the arrangement on this flange. It wasn't that bad. A little tweaking, a little tweaking here, and a little tweaking there. And um, the next step was uh, finishing the, the cuts to use the flexible shape pattern to develop the, the joint here. And uh, I used the blue tape, I've shown it in the other videos, and I slowly grind it in. I didn't do a really, really good job. I've got about a sixteenth, maybe even as much as a three sixteenths gap over here. It'll close up. I've got the correct dock. I've checked it with a, a gauge that we made and I got it all clamped up. In order to clamp it, I took some steel stock underneath because it has this beautiful arc and uh, it's one inch by quarter inch uh, hot roll stock and I put the correct bend in it. I've got one going here and one going here and these four clamps are interacting with that. These two clamps are holding me in the center and then if you remember we have the red witness line and that lines up and it's dead straight and that tells you that the panels are together right this way and the gauge tells you that the panels are together the right this way so you won't have much play to adjust those later on so you got to make sure that it's dead right so I use the gauges and after I get this all done I'll put the flexible two flexible shape patterns together and uh, put them on there and it should lay really nice. So we've got a joint set up and we're about to weld. I just want to say we will be doing a pretty uh, extensive TIG welding video. There will be a video probably all by itself and uh, we have done a little uh, welding before on the front of the E-type nose and since then um, I learn always from my students. Not only did I teach my students, I learn from my students. And uh, through the years, I've had a lot of really good uh, TIG, wel TIG welding uh, uh, tips that have been given to given by the students. And one of them is from a guy from the Netherlands, a young guy, uh, about th two or three years ago. Martin uh, Nellis came over and. Uh, he showed me a technique which I'm going to show in the extensive video on, on welding. Uh, and that technique was to weld the backside of two panels first and not to be too concerned about it and then weld the front side. And uh, he would get consistently amazing results just by fusion welding both sides. And I would get pretty good results but once in a while uh, they weren't as good as he would get. So I've been using a lot of rod. I might use rod on this because I don't have a really tight gap. And um, I also had two students recently, uh, Joey Allen from Pennsylvania, who's got a lot of uh, TIG welding experience, mostly steel, but he's got a lot of aluminum too. And he said, you know, you might be better off using a bigger cup. I had a number eight cup before. And uh, I, I, I found out that number eight was the biggest cup you can get for this. This is small format TIG torch. It's an air-cooled one. But I didn't know that they actually make a larger gas lens. And that was with the gas lens on the smaller format gas lens. This is the larger gas lens cup. And uh, it, I've adopted that in this past weekend. We've had some really good welding results consistent time after time after time so that's what I'm going to show in that welding uh, video and this was one of the secrets was going up on your cup size they this has uh, a 5 8 opening and it has a much larger screen on the on the uh, gas lens 
so you get better coverage on the weld. Uh, they also have a three-quarter opening. You got to pump your, your uh, f gas flow through. And remember, as I said before, I use a 50% helium, 50% argon mix, which I find is almost necessi a necessity for doing aluminum. This thin aluminum, it's just amazing. Now the other breakthrough, and, and uh, another guy, he came in, and he was a really good TIG welder too, and he reinforced what Joey had said about the bigger gas lens and the bigger cup. So here I am with the bigger gas lens, the bigger cup, big improvement and uh, one of the things that this uh, Everlast 210 EXT power TIG welder has is the pulse capacity. You can set uh, all kinds of parameters on this machine and you can spend a whole day which is what I did almost trying to find the optimum settings and especially using the pulse. And I, I tried the pulse before, I was uh, pretty impressed with it, but I wasn't uh, really up to speed on the potential of it. And uh, I hadn't tried pulse tacking before too. But now I've been getting good results with pulse tacking and fusion pulse welding. And that'll be the content for that welding uh, video. But let's give it a try here. Oftentimes when you have aluminum like this where the gap isn't really good, you copper behind it, but I'm going to give it a shot without the copper. It was a pain to, to clamp it all up. And uh, we're probably going to have to use a little rod. So I got it set at 70 amps and I have been doing a really tight fusion joint and as up as much as 120 amps to get, to get good penetration. So uh, let me see what happens here and we'll see if we can pulse tack this. It won't be fusion, I'll have to add a little rod. Alright, I probably should go up on the amperage a little. When you use pulse, you have to have higher amperages. So I'll go up to 80. See if that's any better. That's a pretty big tack. I didn't want to go that big, but that's okay. We'll have to grind it a little bit or melt it in. Yeah, that was pretty good. I'm gonna go to 90. All right, so I used a little stainless steel brush. I get those from Home Depot. I like these a lot better than the real small ones. And uh, we'll put a couple more tacks. We bumped it to 90 amps. So I'm just dropping a little ball on there. And that's working pretty sweet. So now we got a bunch of tacks. We're gonna move this back now a little bit. We'll come work our way right down to the bottom. So get a couple more in here. Just really loving that pulse. I can't believe I've had this welder for probably a year and a half and I really haven't taken uh, advantage of the pulse capacity of it. That's what happens oftentimes. You fear the unknown, you fear the new. You really got to get in there and try it out.
Now it's easy to get it on this side. Once I get this side welded, we'll turn the whole panel around and we'll tack the other side. Now this joint will have to be hammered out. Right now it's uh, a little tight there. Uh, and actually I could probably do a fusion tack right here. Let's see if the 90 amps is enough to do the fusion. Now it opened up a little bit for me, but it, it did partially. Gonna move little Junior in here a little bit. Chair's a little high. Let's see if I can lower my chair a little. There's the lever. That's as low as it goes. Now sometimes when you have a steel clamp nearby, uh, it somehow interferes with the, uh, the welding process. So that's what happened there, kind of jumped onto the clamp a little bit. Important that I get that little last one there, that'll be good. Cleaned up that one that got bugged up a little bit. So there we are. That side is tack sufficiently. And now we're going to turn this thing around 180 degrees and I'll weld that other side. And it is hot. One of the clamps jumped off. I might want to put that back on just to make sure. There we go. Put the ground on.
It's amazing. Once you get uh, a little bit comfortable with that pulse, you start to say, why haven't I been using this pulse all along? It's really nice. Now, I haven't tried the pulse on steel welding at all. This is just on aluminum. So there's so much to still discover. And uh, these Everlast welders are a very reasonable price. So take a look. And they, they're always constantly improving. That was a nice one. I said the most important thing is keeping this flush. If it goes off flush, it causes a problem. So. And typically when you're welding like this, it, as it cools, it pulls the joint back in. So. Uh, we got nice and tight over there. We're just hoping it doesn't affect the um, the actual uh, radius of the total length of the part here. Another nice one. Drop that ball right on there. It's just a surface weld. It's not necessarily has much strength, but it really helps you do the continuous well. We did a nice little setup. We have two benches here and we kind of straddle in the two benches and that leaves the opening for doing the welding and the clamping. The key is do it fast. Seems like the faster you can get in and out of that weld area, the more successful you, you can be. So if you dilly-dally, it doesn't like to uh, catch. clamp out of the way. Move this. Now let's get this brush in here. Remember this is all made with nothing more than flexible shape patterns.
So there we have it. That should be pretty strong right now. Enough to flip it over and take all the clamps off. The actual wells are pretty weak but strong enough to hold together. The reason why it gets strong is as it goes around the corner here. So we're gonna the welding is all on the top. There's no penetration to speak of here. So it shouldn't shouldn't be that strong. If we bent it hot or anything it'll just break real easy right at this point. Alright and these are the little pieces of uh, hot roll steel we bent up to have the right curve and that allowed us to tack it up nicely. So actually we did get some penetration through here, not too bad. So now we'll clean this up good and I'm going to run the back side. But first, I gotta check my chicken I got cooking on the barbecue. Brian from Ohio has been taking my 240 hour extended learning class. And this is the first fender he's ever made. He's done some shaping before, but this is the biggest piece he's ever done and the most uh, advanced uh, complex shape. And this has been done all with flexible shape patterns. And the flexible shape patterns were made off of a very damaged and rough fender that had a lot of bodge repairs on it. And um, it's going to have a wired edge. Right now it only has the 90 degree uh, ed flange on there which will be turned to a wired edge soon. And he's going to finish up the welding uh, on that back section by the running board. But it's a beautifully styled fender. It's a 1937 Riley Sprite. And uh, it just can't get any better. It's just uh, a very well uh, done job and it's a beautiful shape. So here's the front view and I'll have Mark pan over to the right side fender and you can see that's been uh, really bodged pretty bad. Somebody's taken a grinder to the whole thing. There's about at least two or three million uh, surface dents on it that would have to be repaired. A lot of bodge welded in sections. So what's called for over there is the exact same thing. Needs another fender. And now Brian has learned the techniques. He can go back to his own shop and make that other fender. When you get that beauty and the craftsmanship coming together, it's something really outstanding. And I think that's what Brian has done. He's been an excellent student. And uh, he's doing this for his customer. His customer actually paid for his uh, tuition for the class. And I think the customer should be very happy with the results. All right, so just informed by my cameraman, Mark, that uh, we probably won't be able to weld this all up today. We're going to just run the back side, get that welded. I've showed the welding before, and we're going to have the welding video. So on this video here, 8C, we're just going to weld the back side, and then we'll flip her over and you see what it looks like. So here we go. I'm going to start in the middle and come over here, then turn it around and do the other side. Need more amperage, the 70 is not doing it. When I went back up to 90, I brought it down to 70.
see that's a pretty nice weld. My chair angle is very bad. My neck can't take it. I got to get a different chair. That's at uh, 90 amps right now. I'm not using full pedal though. I got pedal control. If I need the amps, they're there. If I don't, I can back off. There's one side. That went pretty well. And you just feed the rod rapidly in and it accepts it really nicely. Get a new rod. Make sure we put the clamp on. Let's see if we can get this side to go quick. There's the little brush. A little brush. Here we go. And there you have it, pulsed welding with a wide gap too. And that was at uh, 90 amps. The trick was uh, every time the weld, the uh, gap started to open up, you had to make sure you could shove that rod in there and close that potential gap up. Now let's flip her over and see what she looks like now. That is our top weld, which is our drop through, and we're not going to do it now. Maybe we'll, uh, I don't know if we'll do it in the next video. I'm not sure. But what will happen here is that'll all get melted right in. In the process of melting it in, we'll be taking and doing these little circles. Joey Allen, uh, improvised that little technique here a couple weeks ago at the class and what that does is it brings the heat into both sides of the panel 
and instead of focusing right on the seam you do these little circles and that brings out more heat aluminum loves heat to weld properly so that'll all melt in it will be really low to the surface it'll be an easy clean up and grind if you had uh, a perfect seam there'd be very little cleanup you can see it didn't dip or anything it's looking really sweet so right now it's a little uh, rough looking it's literally about four or five minutes to go across there and uh, melt that in but that's it for today mark has to get his appointment he's already late and uh, we'll be back uh, with 9a maybe we can get it done in 9a or b maybe not c d and f and all that stuff uh, and that will be next week so until next week we'll see you for pot nine it's racialine please subscribe please share these videos give me a like give me the comments and thanks for watching